Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Michael Calabrese. I direct the Wireless Feature Program uh, here at New America. And I think as you know, most folks know, over, over the years we've been engaged in a whole uh, range of, uh, of topics related to uh, the reform of, uh, of spectrum policy, uh, wireless broadband policy, and, and, and related topics. And, and one issue that uh, keeps recurring, uh, <laughs> somewhat unfortunately, because uh, w we should have resolved it uh, by now, ideally, it is this, this wireless future of public safety. Um, how are we going to get to the nationwide interoperable, uh, you know, voice and broadband network that was so urgently recommended now six years ago, roughly, by the 9-11 Commission. Uh, and, and the co-chairs uh, of that commission recently, you know, spoke out again, encouraging the, uh, uh, the nation to move forward s somewhat along the lines of the FCC's plan, uh, which we'll hear uh, more of shortly. Um, and, and even as each year goes by, really the, the capacity of, of uh, or the ability of, of high capacity mobile broadband networks to improve public safety operations is just, you know, making leaps and bounds. But it's not, it's not available uh, in most places. It's not interoperable where and when it needs to be. Uh, but there are some really exciting advances on the immediate horizon. Uh, for example, um, there's, there's places, one of my favorites is, you know, in Corpus Christi, Texas, you know, for example, where they're using, uh, they keep cops out on the street an extra uh, one and a half hours uh, per shift uh, because they have wireless, wireless uh, field reporting. All of, the, all of the cars have laptops and high-speed wireless access. They have field access to mug shots, uh, DMV, FBI, and other databases. They have uh, video surveillance, for example, along five miles of, of beachfront, uh, in-car two-way video streaming between incident and mobile command centers, uh, Wi-Fi drones over incident sites. I mean, this is the, the sort of mobile future of public safety that we can look forward to. Uh, but we have to get over uh, particularly this debate about, uh, uh, you know, over what airwaves is this new nationwide interoperable system going to be deployed and with what networks or combinations of networks. Uh, the National Broadband Plan addressed that, and, I'll, and I'm going to leave uh, the description of that to our, uh, to our initial speakers who are uh, here from the FCC. Uh, but then there's other perspectives, so particularly the, the question about the so-called D-block, which is some of the returned television spectrum that was freed up a year ago by the DTV transition, uh, public safety uh, has its own allocation of, of four channels. There's an additional block called the D block, uh, which uh, was to be auctioned uh, as part of a public-private partnership to build out a network uh, for public safety, but it actually did not meet the uh, reserve price uh, in the 2008 auction, in part because it was pretty heavily encumbered with requirements. And so part of the debate is, should that block of spectrum uh, you know, be, just, you know, be auctioned with what requirements are given to public safety, for example. And I think you'll hear some different perspectives on that today. So with that, I want to turn it over uh, to the speakers. Um, let me tell you that um, they are all going to come up here initially one at a time uh, because uh, a couple are using PowerPoint. And if we all crowd up here, it's going to be difficult uh, to see the way the room is configured. Uh, so. Um, so I'll just have them, I'll just introduce them one at a time, and uh, we'll have some short initial opening remarks to get everything on the table, then discussion and open it back up uh, to you all uh, for your, um, you know, questions, comments. And when we get to that point, p uh, please identify yourself. This is also being webcast uh, live, so, so welcome as well to anybody watching on the Internet. Uh, f first up is... Uh, James Arden Barnett, Jamie Barnett, who is uh, chief of the FCC's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Uh, Jamie is, uh, 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 holds the rank of, of Rear Admiral, uh, retired. He served 32 years in the U.S. Navy and Navy Reserve, 
retiring in, in 2008 and has, you know, just come on in the, you know, in the past uh, year at the FCC to take up this challenge. So, uh, Jamie, can you, uh, you lead us off and then we'll go to your colleague after that. Michael, thank you so much. Michael, I do appreciate it, and uh, thank thank you uh, and and the New America Foundation for the work that uh, that you do here and for providing this forum today. And thank each of you for being here. I'd also like to thank to the, our, our other speakers for making time to come here. I think it, it will provide a good forum uh, for a healthy discussion about this. So it's an exciting time to to be at the Federal Communications Commission uh, with the National Broadband Plan, in particular for the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau because we were given the challenge uh, of coming up with, um, in essence, a solution, a way forward on a public safety broadband wireless network uh, coming off of, in essence, what was a failed uh, auction uh, of the D block. Uh, and I might add that uh, there is an urgency to this because we have a brief technological window in which to do that, and I'll speak more about that in just a minute and, and the other speakers will as well. So uh, Michael gave you, a, a, I think, a good overview, but just to, to flesh out, uh, when I came in to the, the Bureau in July of 2009 with the, um, the charge from uh, Chairman Julius Janikowski to, to venture forth and come up with solutions on that, I gave a charge to our, uh, our, our team that was working on the Public Safety Broadband Network. There were, there were three things that I was looking for. In, a, in essence, the solution had to be something that was nationwide, truly nationwide, that brought us 99 percent population coverage, that it would truly be interoperable uh, from the inception and, and through time, and number three, that it would be viable, uh, in, in a couple of senses from that, that it would be viable from an engineering standpoint, which would include capacity, and we'll talk about that today, but it would also be viable in the sense that public safety would be able to afford it, and the nation would be able to afford it, and that that uh, commercial partners would want to provide the, the services, the equipment, and everything that goes with it since uh, commercial viability was something that I think uh, sank the, uh, the previous D-Block um, uh, auction. So uh, what we came up in, in, in just a few words was using the public safety spectrum that Congress uh, previously uh, provided, uh, so 10 megahertz of really great waterfront, beachfront uh, property in the 700 megahertz uh, frame. Um, how, how can we develop it? That is a lot of spectrum, and, and you'll hear Dr. John Pia talk about that in, in just a minute, about what that could have, because spectrum is one thing and, and capacity is another. But what about those bad days when we have, a, you know, God forbid, uh, another 9-11, uh, when because of the intensity of an emergency and the number of first responders that you have in that area, or because of the widespread nature uh, of the emergency, we, we need more capacity. And that's why what I think is one of the more uh, innovative, aspects, innovative aspects of this uh, proposal is the ability to roam over onto commercial networks. Uh, and so uh, if, if you're able to see whoever the D-Block licensee would be, uh, and you could also see other parts of the spectrum, there's Verizon, uh, AT&T, and others. Um, if you can roll over and use that capacity, that adds 10, 20, 50, maybe more uh, megahertz of spectrum for that particular bad day. Uh, now, this would be compensated because, of course, we, don't, we're not, we understand the carriers offering service. It would also provide priority access to public safety uh, users, a uh, very important part because when they make the call, they need to be able to make sure they go through. One of the things I would emphasize that we have to do in this is we have to move beyond the old land mobile radio, narrow band, high tower uh, concept of, of doing things. This is the new world, broadband, packet switched uh, world where when you push and if you're given priority, the, pa the packets start flowing immediately. That's the way that we need to think about this low tower, small cell uh, diameter, and, and we'll talk about that as well today. That provides, uh, with this roaming ability, it provides not only uh, the, the additional capacity, it also provides more resiliency and redundancy than we could have in a single public safety network alone. Recently, the um, public safety network in, New in uh, Washington, D.C. went down for a number of hours. It would have been great if they could have roamed over onto commercial networks and continued to, to operate in, in that standpoint. This network also needs to be hardened. And so we provided in, our, in a very detailed cost model that was developed over months, talking to experts, 
hundreds of meetings, emails, forums, uh, workshops with public safety officials, uh, their the commission, uh, telephone calls with them in order to get the information that we needed on this uh, to, to come up with the concepts that, that we have in this. But one of the, the most important things about ensuring that there's the capacity we need with the network is, of course, funding. Uh, there's no interoperability if there's no network, and that's why we have come up with a detailed cost model that would call for $6.5 billion in public funding to actually build out the network, capital expenditures. And we also recognize that public safety is going to have to maintain its voice networks for some considerable amount of time, and therefore there needs to be operating uh, expenses as well, and the National Broadband Plan call in this. The key that we are here today to talk about, though, is capacity. And we looked hard at this because we wanted to make sure, from that viability standpoint, that this is something that works for public safety on a day-to-day -day basis and on uh, in that bad day, that 9-11 type of day. And for that reason, we've, we've been very uh, fortunate to have folks like uh, Walter Johnson at the, at the commission, uh, Dr. John Pihaw, uh, who came to us from Carnegie Mellon University and actually established the, the public safety communications I'm going to get the name wrong. Institute there. You can tell me the, tell them the right name. Um, and is, has been our chief technologist. And so um, I'll, I'll let uh, Michael introduce him. But at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back to Michael. And thank you very much uh, for being here today. Thanks, Michael. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll hear more, uh, a little more in the weeds from, from the FCC right now from uh, John Pia, who is the chief technologist at the FCC and also a full professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where the name of that the center he's uh, you know uh, been directing is the University Center for Wire Wireless and Broadband Networking, and, and we've known John for uh, uh, an, an even longer time. He was on Capitol Hill uh, as an advisor, um, and it also uh, wrote a paper for. That New America published uh, and, and released in an event like this about four, almost four years ago on shared spectrum, shared networks before the D block was called the D block, and uh, and, and John uh, even at that time sort of foresaw uh, and outlined what is more or less the FCC's plan today. So John, you want to uh, tell us more about it? Yeah, I'd forgotten that it was like four or five years ago where I was calling for as a professor for fundamental reform. I just happened to see the in public safety uh, communications. I never imagined I would you know, be, be back five years later following Admiral Barnett, who is going to, to lay out what I think is a very strong plan for fundamental reform. And I would now be trapped on the inside of the government um, trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, drilling down on one piece of, of this plan, which is the, the capacity as issues of of the uh, the kind of network uh, public the interoperable wireless network that uh, that Chief Barnett was talking about. Um, that's not because it is the only issue. That is not because it is even the most important issue. I wish we were talking about, but it is the most hotly debated issue. So uh, it is worth discussing. It is also, I think, uh, an issue that's not completely understood. So I think there are some misconceptions. One of those misconceptions is that the amount of spectrum that you have tells you how much communication you can support, how much useful work you can do with this thing. And it isn't true. Uh, in fact, worse, well, uh, you, I mean, what users care about is the amount of capacity they have. They care about the performance they get. Users don't generally even know how much spectrum their provider has. And capacity depends on many factors. It depends, yes, in part on the amount of spectrum you get, but it depends on the kind of architecture you use, depends on the type of technology you use, and it depends, very important, on the amount of infrastructure you build. Something I'll keep coming back to. How, how many sites do you build out in your network? So a, a related to that misconception is not only is, the, is capacity not the same as spectrum, but uh, you know, if you think, if you if you're thinking about what what capacity has been possible for public safety in the past, what what you can get per megahertz in the past, and you think that's what you're going to get in the future, you're going to be very far off. And I think that contributes to the misunderstanding. Um, as 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 we heard in the opening talk, this, this is a very new game. We're talking about leaping forward, 
in a very different kind of network than, is, than, than has been in use in the past. So today, most systems in public safety use something called LMR. Uh, an LMR architecture, you have a small number of towers, each serving a large area with the gaps in between to prevent interference among them. Um, it's a great idea if you want to minimize the number of towers, you want to minimize the amount of capital investment, uh, but it's very wasteful of spectrum. So oftentimes public safety is very hard to you know, get capital investment, spectrum is free, this is actually a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, but there is another way, there's a newer way, uh, actually this is a 40 year old way, but it is a newer way, and that is a cellular architecture. Right? This, is, this is what all of the commercial providers have adopted, and that is instead, as, as you can see down, oops, sorry, uh, going backwards. So much for my advanced technology. <laughs> it's good in theory. Um, so with, with the approach on the right, which I'm going to not point to because I'll, uh, we have many towers, each covering small areas with no gaps between them. And from one of these little circles, that is these cells to another, you can reuse the same spectrum over and over. You get a lot more capacity per megahertz that way. Um, and in fact, when a, cellular, when a commercial provider wants to increase capacity, how do they do it? Usually, they build more sites. So with this, you can get a lot more. In fact, for example, there was a, a study looking at Southern California, which said, which, which, which said if, you, if you use this, uh, if, if, you, if you instead of using, reusing spectrum the way it is today, with these kind of architectures, if you, if you use a cellular type approach and reuse even, even a, a pre-LTE cellular approach, you could increase the capacity per megahertz by a factor of 16. That is 10 megahertz could do the work of what would have been 160 megahertz. Um, and you can see that in, if you also compare utilization. If you compare what commercial providers have today with what public safety has today, you see that the spectrum per user in public safety is about 20 to 25 times more than the spectrum per user in the commercial world. That's because they use very different techniques. Um, so with the, with the policies proposed in the National Broadband Plan, we believe we can reduce this gap significantly while meeting public safety requirements by, by adopting some of the same approaches. So again, key got to have enough sites. And if you have enough sites, in fact, a system operating in 10 megahertz with more sites can have more total capacity than a system operating in 20 megahertz with fewer sites. Um, also, by the way, you get better performance and better signal reliability. And given public safety has real need for signal reliability, you really need to build a lot more sites anyway. You're not even doing it just for capacity. Um, so the National Broadband Plan recommends 44,000 sites uh, and funding to support those sites. Uh, this would put them a little bit behind AT&T and Verizon and ahead of everybody else to serve a much, much smaller number of users. So this is a serious network. So how serious? What can you do with it? Well, to, you know, we need, for public safety, we need to go beyond routine needs. We need to look at emergencies. And the FCC did. We analyzed a series of emergencies, one based on a bridge collapse in Minneapolis, one based on a hurricane in Houston, based upon Hurricane Ike, uh, and one that is a hypothetical dirty bomb terrorist attack in midtown Manhattan in midday. In each of these cases, we assumed 10 megahertz of spectrum only. We assumed LTE technology. We assume that, again, the number of sites are built out in accordance with the plan. You've got, to, you've got to consider that. And we assume that first responders use a variety of applications, voice, video, maps, data, et cetera. And in each of these scenarios, we found that the capacity is sufficient. Uh, we will have a, a paper coming out uh, that is forthcoming where you can, you can, you can see all the gory details. Um, now, of course, you can always imagine, and you can talk about any scenario, I can always imagine a worse scenario. Um, however much capacity public safety has, we can imagine cases where they'd want or we'd want them to have more. And for that, we believe a very cost-effective approach is priority roaming. So the National Broadband Plan recommends that public safety have the ability to roam on a priority basis onto commercial networks, and they're up to 70 megahertz of spectrum in the 700 band. So if you compare that to trying to meet all of these requirements 
with dedicated public safety spectrum, priority roaming has important advantages. First of all, uh, it simply gives public safety access to far more capacity than you could realistically expect it to have in dedicated spectrum, even if you give it 20 or 40 megahertz of spectrum. Second, all that good capacity, all those valuable resources, when public safety doesn't need them, get to do other useful things. They get to, to serve the public and bring wireless services. And finally, it improves dependability for public safety. Right? If, if, if I am a, a police officer on the scene and a tornado has taken out my cell tower, hopefully I can roam on to a different network. Another aspect of, of improving capacity and cost as well is to take advantage of commercially available technology wherever possible. And one thing you need to make sure of is that equipment will operate in the public safety band. So the way the National Broadband Plan goes about dealing with this problem is it makes it a requirement of the D-Block auction, that the D-Block licensee will be required to produce LTE-based devices that operate in the public safety band, and of course in the D-Block as well. Um, there are other things you can do to enhance capacity. Uh, you can use deployable equipment and, and you can use in-building equipment to extend coverage. Both of those things, there are recommendations in the, in the broadband plan, but I think I'll move quickly along. Uh, note the, the last point, uh, we also really need to think about all of the resources. Um, 700 megahertz is a great band for mobile devices and, and that can operate anywhere because right, it's good for covering the area. If you have stationary devices, particularly those that generate or receive lots and lots of data, suggest that there are other bands that, they're very, that are very useful for that, or wires if they're fixed devices. So to summarize, total capacity depends on a lot of factors. It is not just spectrum. And particularly important is that we need uh, to build out enough infrastructure, and we need the mechanisms and the funding to do that. Um, a network operating in 10 megahertz in accordance with the National Broadband Plan, that is with 44,000 sites, LTE technology can do quite a lot. Uh, by commercial standards, 10 megahertz to serve a couple of million people is a lot of spectrum. Um, it, it will do far more than, than we're accustomed to seeing with past experience for 10 megahertz worth of spectrum in public, in, in public safety. And we found that in these serious emergencies, it, it, uh, in our scenarios, it was adequate. That is for a, a hurricane in Houston, a bridge collapse, and a terrorist attack in Manhattan. Um, for even bigger emergencies, we think priority roaming is uh, for always for the worst case. No matter how much capacity you have, priority roaming is a great way to go more capacity available for public safety than you could realistically expect any other way, resources put to use even when public safety doesn't need them, and better dependability for public safety. And we want to make use of commercial technology, which we do through the uh, D-Block auction requirements that we're required to make the uh, equipment available that operates in the public safety band. Thank you. All right, thanks, John. Uh, our next speaker is Robert Lagrande, who is the former Chief Technology Officer of the District of Columbia government, uh, you know, right here, and is currently uh, President and CEO of, of Lagrande Technical and Social Services, LLC. And when Rob was uh, here in D.C., in fact, what we had him uh, speak, I think it was probably at that same event with, with John uh, way back, and, uh, um, and another one we did with John McCain, where I remember you showed us the, the incredible uh, hazmat um, uh, uh, pilot that you did as, as part of the, I think it was part of the, the, the National Capital Region's interoperability program that you uh, p pioneered. And, and uh, Rob also developed uh, the nation's first citywide uh, broadband wireless uh, network for first responders, a, a pilot that's been uh, a, real, a real model. So uh, take it away. Okay, well, um, the last time I gave this presentation I had 10 minutes, so now I have five minutes. I'm going to make him <laughs> stand up about seven. So uh, this is a lot of material. I'm going to give it to you very quickly. First, the folks here, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak before you again. And certainly to the FCC, um, you know, we continue to disagree on some things. I'm going to highlight those things. But even before I get there, I want to show progress. And I don't have a problem showing progress. 
the last time we got together, oh, by the way, I get the award for the ugliest chart. Right? <laughs> so, but this is a chart that shows a vision, right? It, and guess what? In order to establish a goal, you need a vision. And this was established with uh, APCO some, times, some time ago. I had a, a facilitated session where I said, you know what? Let's put it all on a piece of paper and let's aim for the goal. The goal, National Interoperable Broadband Networks. Now, last time I was with the commission, a few months back, I did some color coding here just so that we can see in the majority of places, we agree. We do. We agree that it, the goal should be a national interoperable broadband network. The goal should be to have ruggedized voice, video, and data devices. Um, the goal should be to have priority roaming and preemption. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. And to have full multimedia applications. I've got some concerns there in the yellow. And then, of course, the thing that we're all here to talk about is the ongoing saga of the D-Block. And we'll continue to disagree on that, so really good job presentation. But you know I have some points that I have to make as we continue our long-standing debate. Hopefully we're not retired in a retirement home having this debate all <laughs> over. Um, so the good news is in education and training, for the most part in governance standards, funding, research, and development, operational procedures and exercises, guess what? We agree with the FCC's plan, at least certainly in my view of it because it's consistent with the direction that I think everyone has said they'd want to go. Look at all the green here. That's great. I mean, this is what you want, kind of want to talk about, John, all the green. Leverage networks, funding. We agree that there needs to be a lot of funding. We agree that we should leverage the commercial networks infrastructure. We agree with the technical and operational standards, voice communication in the converged environments of the ubiquitous national public safety network, all in agreement with what's in the plan. And of course, as I said earlier, the ruggedized voice, video, and data devices. And, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, we're really happy that you approve those waivers. You're, you, you guys are a team of your words. You said you're going to make sure you do something by early summer. You approve those waivers, and you actually, to the extent that I can say that you worked with the NTIA, I'll say that the, we were happy to see the NTIA put out a special broadband, um, uh, broadband B top funding to support those 21 jurisdictions. Guess what, guys? We took our first foot forward. So give ourselves a hand as a country. Come on. Okay. Can we just stay on this one? No. <laughs> nope. Sorry. <laughs> you feel your chin being pushed up? So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but no, seriously, I mean, we've been at this a long time. And, you know, basically, you know, the money has to be out by September. And short time after that, you're going to have your first public safety wireless broadband networks. The future of public safety is starting now. And, you know, no one's happier than me, I think, on that because we've really been out at it a long time. Now, on the issue of the D-block, got to go there. Um, well, let me start with roaming and then go to the D-block. First of all, no one disputes the value of roaming. Let me give you, I was down in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, speaking to the officials down there last week, and I said, imagine a world where the first one to the major hurricane that knocks out everyone's communications, imagine that world where the first um, um, the first uh, a sale on wheels or the first Eno bead on wheels shows up and they turn it on and everyone's devices just start working. Everyone's, public safety, citizens, everyone. No passing out devices, no doing any quick training of who's on what channel and what. Imagine a world in a converged environment. Now, how can we get to that world? No one debates or disputes the fact that we want to be on LTE and we want to share the network infrastructures with the carriers such that when they get to an incident, they turn on theirs or we turn on our emergency deployables, the communication systems start working. Nobody's debating whether or not we should have roaming or, 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 or priority. No one's debating that at all. The only debate for us is 20 megahertz is better than 10 megahertz. All that you said, John, was great. But the bottom line for public safety, 20 megahertz is better than 10 megahertz. And certainly in the case of a roaming partner, could you imagine a roaming partner with, I'll just throw a roaming partner out there that doesn't have any spectrum, that might end up getting spectrum in a D-block auction, right? Let's just say they have 10 and they don't need to guard ban. Let's just say that they depend on their entire commercial network, just that 10 megahertz, just that, and they're a roaming partner. Now, wouldn't I be a better technically, I mean, really, if, if, they, if I had 20 megahertz of spectrum, how often would I have to bother them to roam onto their network? How often? And actually, from the public standpoint, what we're doing is building capacity. Now, I totally agree with you if we can freeze all of our network uses right now. If we're not doing this, but you know, my daughter is sitting in the back room, let me tell you, what she's doing with that droid every day is driving me crazy. That, it's no shameless pun for Verizon or anything like that, okay? But the short answer, the appetite is going here, guys, and we can't design our networks in our future based on this. 
So we know that there's going to be additional needs. In fact, on the spectrum issue, guys, you already said that you know in the future we're going to need additional spectrum. You already said that. That's not a question of what you said it already. So our standpoint is, look, to go with a great national broadband plan for public safety, I know you're going to repeat that, great national broadband plan for public safety, we need a spectrum plan to go with that. If it's not enough to tell me you're not going to give us the D block, but you can't tell us you're not going to tell us what you're going to give us in the future, because how can we scale and architect our networks for the future? Look at the impact on the business environment just by not knowing what spectrum we're going to have in the future. We have to answer those questions. So void of the D block, guys, you've got to tell us what, what the future is going to be. Okay? So it's very important that we continue. And I've got some points I'm going to make, but I, I just wanted to say one more thing as it relates to the early build-outs. Now that we've done that phased first, what I'll call first phase early build-out, those 21 jurisdictions, now what I believe we need is a comprehensive end-to-end -end phased approach of investment. It's great that we're off and running on the, D, on the, on the 21, but what, what's next? So, you know, I changed that to green, that used to be yellow, so now that's green, but the one, the one thing is, hey, let's put a plan together, show a phased approach, phased investment, and let's get the rest of the jurisdictions. Let's build a little, learn a little, and build more based on what we've done before. So, and on the governance thing, I'll continue, we'll talk about Eric at a different time because I want to move over to my points that I want to make as it relates specifically to your presentation, John. Okay, so, the short answer is what's in the best interest of public safety? Two things, spectrum and funding. No question, spectrum and funding, okay? On this issue of the roaming to the 70, I would like to just say that, look, you're talking about the whole band, right? 70 megahertz that we get roamed to. Theoretically, if I was a CTO of a, a city or a county or a state, I would have to set up roaming agreements with all of the carriers in that band to take advantage of that. Now, you know they're not going to give me all that capacity, so it's kind of not necessarily, well, there you go. For me to say I'm going to get 70, I'm going to have access to 70, because first of all, if I do 70 per user, that's going to be, let's call it $20 per user for roaming, and let's say there's three, well, that's $60 a month. Well, $60 a month just for roaming? Just to have access to, to theoretical 70 megahertz of spectrum in roaming? No, 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 that's, we, we can't do that, right? That's, that, that model doesn't work, it's not sustainable. Now, on that issue of the number of towers versus capacity and things of that nature, I would just suggest, I would just suggest that the capacity with 20 megahertz with 44,000 towers is going to be way better. Nobody can argue that. <laughs> okay, we can argue whether or not, you can debate whether or not it's good enough or anything like that, but it's going to be 20 megahertz with 44,000 is going to be better for public safety. And as I said to you earlier, and as I said to you, and you said yourself, you know, the question of is it going to be more or less costly, but with, let, me, let me just say, with 20 megahertz, with 10 megahertz of spectrum, you know you're going to need additional, uh, additional towers. What you're doing is, in fact, increasing operational costs of the networks forever because we have to build out more infrastructure. So the operation ongoing over and over, year over year costs are going to be significant over that period of time, and they're going to be, in, they're going to stay here. We're going to start here. 20 megahertz, we'll start lower, or we can find some, the best balance. Now, at the end of the day, guys, this is, we know where this exists. We, you know, most of this exists on the Hill for us to debate this issue, but technically, this is the way I see things. Um, I do believe you guys are doing a great job of putting this together. I understand the positions that you're taking, but as it relates to the D block in particular, we know that, 20 megahertz is better than 10 megahertz, and we should really talk about what's in the best interest of public safety. So a couple of points, John, just on your, um, on, and I can't wait to see the details. It's questions like, um, how many users did you consider, you know, in your, in your base for your exercises? Um, what was the, uh, you know, did, do you envision these networks to be a government enterprise versus public safety? See, for example, when I had the network here in the district, both of them, I gave over access to, to everyone I could. Because actually, it is, it's better for my model, my cost model, my cost-benefit analysis to have more users from my private network operating on my network. So I'm, I'm putting social workers. I'm just like, you know, and get, think about it for a second. How do you optimize your government enterprise? Well, you give them things that actually can optimize their operation procedures. Well, the way you do that is to make them mobile if you can, especially if they're like, you know, social workers and so forth. So you, by doing that, you increase the number of users on the network that you're calculating on. So I would like to see your numbers because if those scenarios were based on just public safety numbers well you know the Department of Health and, and others that are non-traditional public safety users transportation and things like that should be factored into the model but you know I, I don't know the number so I but I would say that in the models and the perspectives that we should take should be based on that um, funding we've talked you know around funding too often let me talk directly to it and this is my opinion my opinion only D block is currently scored well 
don't correct me, but it, I'm just going to say 1.5, oh, make it $2 billion it scored in, okay? The public safety broadband plan is about $16 billion, right? $16 billion. So public safety's plan, which includes the D block, is really only $18 billion. So the Delta is only public safety's plan is $18 billion. The FCC's plan is $16 billion. The question is, is I know we keep talking about funding, but we know that the D block is not going to make up the difference of $16 billion. It's going to make up some, some Delta thereof. So we're actually looking at something way less than that for public safety if we follow public safety's plan, which is to get the D block and to get the funding. And the question of offsets, if you want public safety, if you look at it, they've already said it in various, various environments, that they're willing to consider offsets. Which means, of course, once they roam, or once they roam, sorry, going backwards, once they, once they move on to a converged environment, voice, video, and data is available, that they can actually make some spectrum available to offset the cost of actually moving forward within spectrum. Now, this D block is specially located. It's right next to the public safety spectrum. So I'll leave you one thing. This is, if you could go back 20, 30 years, and you can just take two things, I submit to you the two things that you would take in order to fix all the interoperability problems that we're dealing with in lay mobile radio today. You take two things. You take spectrum and you take money. That's what we need to do for public safety. We know that's in the best interest of public safety and that's the direction that we should take our country. So in 20 years, John and I won't be debating this. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, next up, Steve Sharkey, who is uh, Senior Director for Regulatory and Spectrum Policy at Motorola uh, here in Washington, and uh, has just been a long time uh, spectrum policy expert around town. Steve? All right, thank you. Um, and I'll actually start off. I think uh, Robert did a great job uh, in starting off in his presentation talking about some of the areas where we have agreements with the FCC, and, and he is right on. There are a lot of areas of agreement, um, and I know there's been a lot of hard work at the Commission to move this issue forward. The, you know, the agreement that a nationwide interoperable broadband network for public safety is uh, you know, a key priority that we should be working toward, and, and a network that leverages commercial technologies and economies, the economies of scale that will come from commercial technologies. Um, and that includes a cellularized um, technology for public safety to increase capacity. Nobody has been talking about basing a public safety network in the 700 megahertz band for broadband services on a high site uh, deployment similar to what we do for, uh, for LMR technologies. The reasons that we've done it for LMR, it's efficient for the way public safety communicates, which is often in a one-to-many configuration, but it's not the kind of network that you would deploy for these kinds of services, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, we agree that there must be spectrum and funding to build out and operate the network, and the FCC has done a great job of putting forward proposals that I think have really moved, uh, you know, moved things forward, particularly on the funding issues, um, and that there will be uh, partnerships between public safety and commercial carriers, and that that will play an important role both in building, uh, building out the networks and allowing roaming onto commercial networks to uh, uh, enhance coverage and, and even capacity. Um, it's important, though, that the network be built out as a public safety network to meet public safety's operational requirements, that public safety not be viewed as just a, um, another entity and another customer on a commercial network, that uh, public safety has got the coverage, the capacity, the control that they need to really complete their mission. Um, and so I think the debate is really around that. What, you know, what does public safety need to get that kind of coverage, capacity, and control? Um, we're focusing here today really on that capacity issue. And, you know, we've provided a lot of information that, uh, about what we think the capacity and requirements for public safety are uh, for video, for data communications, for um, responding to emergencies. Um, and 
so you know we've got some some concerns about what the what the FCC has put forward on uh, their proposal to auction auction a D block, and those are really that it doesn't under the current plan public safety won't have sufficient capacity to meet their requirements. That the plan therefore will effectively force public safety into working with just the D block licensee that they won't have the kind of choice that uh, is being discussed to work with any number of partner carriers, um, and that it will create too great a dependency on the carriers to meet their day-to-day um, -day requirements for, uh, for capacity. And so we believe that the most straightforward way for dealing with, these, uh, with a lot of these problems is to reallocate, uh, reallocate D block to public safety. So let me talk a little bit on the capacity issue. Um, so John has provided uh, some information talking about some of the scenarios and we're, you know, we'll be interested to see some of the details behind scenarios, uh, large scale emergencies, certainly that's, you know, those are appropriate to look at. Um, and those obviously go well beyond what they would, what public safety will need on a day to day um, basis. Disagrees with, or that's different than the um, information that we've uh, had in our in our analysis on this issue where we've looked at really much more day-to-day -day, um, emergencies an overturned truck where you're going to have you know some 50 first responders with 25 or so vehicles um, you know need for video need for data um, or responding to a to a building and you know we're showing that it the 10 megahertz will not meet the requirements in those kinds of, of uh, uh, of even day-to-day -day events that public safety um, uh, experiences. And so that's going to create a, uh, a problem where uh, uh, the uh, public safety is going to really have to rely on the commercial carriers for, uh, for their capacity. You know, it's, it's interesting because when you look at the FCC's broadband report, they talk about the need for identifying an additional, making available an additional 500 megahertz of spectrum um, for broadband services, and cite to things like 5,000% uh, growth of data traffic in AT&T's network over three years as uh, smart devices were, were introduced. Um, estimates by Cisco that um, data traffic will increase from 17 petabytes per month in 2009 to 270, or 270 petabytes per month in 2014. So that's a 40 fold increase in traffic in five years. So, you know, there is a recognized trend that as um, services and devices become available, we see this explosion of uh, data traffic and need. Yet we seem to be looking at public safety in a kind of static, here's what we think they need today view rather than trying to meet. What, uh, what we know the demand will be in the future. Um, public safety, everything that we're seeing from public safety is that they are going to very much be a power user on these networks. That as um, particularly video becomes widely available, they're going to want it in their patrol cars so that, the, uh, so that officers are not alone when they're making traffic stops. Um, they're going to want on-scene video so that um, remote command can be effective and to really get a good view of what's going on. And it, it's got to be um, quality video. Incidents like the Minnesota bridge collapse, where they were lucky enough to get three video streams back to their command center, really showed the value of, of having that video. Now, they were able to do that because they happened to be building a municipal Wi-Fi network uh, that wasn't turned over to the public. And they were able to get that and use that for their video, um, but I don't think that's the kind of you know that's not the kind of thing that we can count on to uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for for public safety um, to, to take that to, to chance. They've got to have that dedicated resource. Um, next, I think you know from our point of view, the FCC plan really limits public safety's ability to work with a variety of carriers because of some of the technical issues around D-Block. Um, public safety deploying in the existing public safety spectrum will experience interference from an adjacent D-Block deployment. 
and that interference looks very much like what we saw in the 800 megahertz band where we saw holes of interference to public safety created around SMR sites where that was unusable. Now, when you looked at across the whole network, the percentage of interference was very low, but it became critical in, the, in these coverage holes that were experienced, and often in the most uh, dense areas where uh, public safety may need it the most. So we're setting up a scenario where you're going to repeat that, that kind of interference situation unless steps are, are done to, uh, to address those. And the solutions are not particularly attractive. Um, they can part, public safety could partner with the D-Block licensee so that the system is deployed as a single network so that uh, sites are co-located and um, uh, so that the systems look either very much the same or, or are the same network, but that effectively eliminates them from working with, uh, with, uh, with other carriers or partnering with, other, um, with others on this. You can use a portion of the D-block as a guard band, but you need about two megahertz of spectrum to uh, create an effective guard band between D-block and the PSST spectrum. So assuming that you're not taking out the PSST spectrum, and you're taking out a D block, you now go from a 2 by 5 megahertz of usable spectrum to 2 by 3 megahertz of usable spectrum. Significantly degrades the usability and value of that spectrum. Another option is that public safety deploys uh, a much larger number of sites to address the interference. Now, again, we weren't looking at this as uh, as a high site LMR kind of deployment when we've done the, the interference analysis. And the interference analysis is all based on the models that are used by the commercial industry. We're, use, we're deploying similar networks, but in, in, uh, without coordinating the sites so that they're not co located. Um, so, to, you know, to address that kind of interference, you're going to have to deploy a, a much larger number of, of sites. And I think to Robert's point about the value of D-Block and, you know, the relative, well, I mean, it's hard to call $2 billion small, but, you know, relative to this debate uh, and the cost of uh, deploying further, uh, further sites uh, up to twice as many sites, it's, you know, it is not a good value proposition. <laughs> Finally, I just want to touch on the... Uh, the operational cost of public safety for using broadband. So one of the things we've talked about is roaming and priority preemption. And based on what we're seeing in public safety, that they are going to significantly exceed the uh, 10 megahertz capacity as they do their day-to-day -day operations, they're going to have to rely on roaming onto public safety networks on a regular basis to meet their capacity requirements. Uh, the, Robert brought up the point of the cost of roaming agreements and paying for, for roaming. Um, that's going to significantly increase their operational costs for their network. Public Safety Today pays some $2 billion to, uh, to carriers for, uh, for use of their networks and um, roaming now. And that is only going to increase as we, you know, as we look to this kind of a model. So, you know, we've got to figure in those costs as a, you know, as a cost to, to public safety. So considering that D-Block is really only 2% of the 500 megahertz that is being looked at to be made available, um, and given the relative values and benefits of reallocating this very unique um, piece of spectrum to public safety, and it is unique because of its location immediately adjacent to the PSST um, spectrum, it is a one-time opportunity that we have to get this right and to make the you know make a contiguous block of spectrum available to public safety uh, <clears throat> to provide the most cost-effective um, and most capacity-effective solution available for public safety. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, next, uh, Kathleen O'Brien Ham is, is Vice President uh, for Federal Regulatory Affairs at T-Mobile uh, USA, and it's, it's had a long career before this at, at the FCC, 14 years, right, including 
Deputy Chief of the, of the Wireless Bureau. So, Kathleen, you want to make a few remarks? Thank you, yeah. Um, one of the things I used to do at the FCC is I licensed public safety spectrum, and I used to do the auctions. So I, I know a little bit about both uh, from my experience of being at the FCC for 14 years. Anyhow, I want to thank the uh, folks here today for uh, pulling this together. I think this is a really important topic. And uh, I really particularly want to thank the folks from the FCC. Uh, having spent so many years at the FCC, I know all the hard work that goes into this. And uh, T-Mobile is very supportive of uh, the Commission's national broadband plan uh, for a variety of reasons. We think that, you know, auctioning the spectrum is the right thing to do. Uh, we think partnering with public safety is the right thing to do. And we think that uh, they've laid out sort of a very holistic plan that I think tries to deal with the spectrum issues, the capacity issues, the operational issues, and the funding issues. And for the very first time, I think uh, somebody's really, uh, you know, thought this all the way through. So we're very supportive uh, of the FCC's plan, and I think we'd like to see it uh, succeed and go to auction. You know, we're very concerned about, I think, the balkanization of the 700 megahertz band. Uh, we're part of the 4G coalition that includes Sprint, Clearwire, uh, T-Mobile, uh, Metro PCS, U.S. Cellular, and uh, uh, Leap. Uh, basically everybody but AT&T and Verizon. And th this group has put forward some technical papers, uh, one in particular on the band and how to uh, manage this band in a way that simplifies it that we think is pro-competitive and is going to provide uh, opportunities both for the commercial sector but also public safety uh, to basically benefit from that commercial ecosystem of handsets and so forth, providing opportunities for more competition in that space. That's something that I have some experience with from my days at the FCC. I think that <clears throat> public safety tends to be very captured by a few vendors and it limits their opportunities to actually get the very best technology. And I think the, the opportunity that public safety has here is really a good one that they need to grasp. And that is to get in on the ground floor, which I think nobody disagrees with getting that leverage from the commercial sector is a positive thing for public safety. And so I think some of the things that we, <coughs> as, a, as a commercial carrier, really want to uh, see happen here is that kind of a partnership uh, uh, experience, I think, here with the 700 megahertz band is something that both public safety and commercial carriers can benefit by creating enough opportunity in the band and, and a, a technological opportunity, I think, that uh, enables public safety to, you know, benefit from the best technology, from those economies of scale and scope that often they don't have the benefit of. And I think they also leverage the uh, commercial networks. I mean, our, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer, but I hang out with engineers, and engineers tell me that one of the most expensive pieces of the network is that radio access network. And so having the ability to share that between commercial and public safety is, is really a big deal. And I think what we would urge is that public safety sort of think about the difference between ownership of the spectrum and control. And there's ways that uh, you know, they can work with uh, commercial carriers who would, yes, have ownership of the spectrum, but public safety through the core network could have, have control and the type of applications that I think that they're looking for. So we're very, you know, we're very high on this concept. We're very positive about it. We think it's, it, it has benefits for public safety. And it's pro-competitive, I think, from the standpoint of getting more commercial uh, carriers into the 700 megahertz band. If that's truly going to be the LTE band in the U.S., I think that's an important thing for the commission to consider. So that's, those are my thoughts, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion today. Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. And our, our final uh, panelist, and then, is Ed Thomas. Who can come up and, and then and then they'll, after Ed, uh, everyone will come back up here and we can have 
bit of discussion and questions. Ed is, is currently a, a partner at Wiltshire and Granis, uh, a law firm here in, in uh, D.C., and he was, uh, in, until 2005, uh, was the chief engineer at the FCC and has held the whole w long series of, of technology jobs in the private sector, which is on the longer bio. So, Ed, would you like to uh, round us out here? and the New America Foundation for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, being the last person on an agenda really gives you very little to say. <laughs> but I'm going to make it up, so it could work. Steve threw me a, a, a pitch that I couldn't let go. So before I get into the shtick that I had planned, I just want to address it. And it has to do with the interference with the, with the D block and uh, comparing it to the uh, 800 rebanding issue. I, I would argue that that's not a problem. The problem at 800 uh, uh, was a very simple one. You had high, uh, high site locations. Uh, at the periphery of those high site locations, on occasion, on rare occasions, you had a cell site that was high powered. That caused interference. If you have a, and it was basically in a hole. If you build a cellular network uh, as proposed by the FCC plan, first of all, the holes tend to disappear, or at worst, the number of holes are totally and completely minimized. So that kind of problem I don't think will exist, and we could debate that when we sit up here. I have a very personal interest in um, putting together a, a interoperable broadband network for public safety. I tried it working uh, with my staff at the FCC and we failed. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that and I don't want to dredge uh, up old history, but I really believe the FCC's got it right this time. And if I look at this thing, there are really three things that are required for a public safety network. First of all, you want it spectrally efficient, but you want it to provide the capacity necessary at the time necessary, at the place necessary. Secondly, you want it affordable. And last but not least, you want it to meet the requirements of public safety. Now, that's from 20,000 feet, so let's try to get down a little closer to the mud, but not very close. And let's start, start talking a little about the use of spectrum by public safety. Typically, it's underused. But when you need it, you need it big time. Um, what that means is uh, you have a, when you have a, God forbid, a disaster like a Katrina or like a World Trade Center or, God forbid, the next one that we have, it, the odds are pretty high you're going to need more spectrum uh, than is allocated. And I would almost argue there's no way that that 10 megahertz is going to solve that kind of problem, you know, the additional 10 megahertz associated with the D block. In the vast majority of the instances, the spectrum is underused. In fact, public safety has 25 times more spectrum per user than the commercial folks do. And if you look at the numbers, just to give you some perspective, the commercial guys have in round figures 50, uh, 550 megahertz, and public safety today has 100 megahertz. Admittedly, 50 is at 4 gigahertz, and you could argue about the propagation capabilities of this. The other secret is they do indeed have 24 megahertz at 700. Now, half of that is at least um, by FCC rules dedicated to uh, P25 uh, narrowband transmission. But frankly, if I were in public safety, the first thing I would be doing is petitioning the FCC to let me use the entire public safety allocation uh, for broadband or anything I want. And bingo, I got it, and I haven't even uh, impinged on the D block. Obviously, if you add the D block, uh, in the main, 30 is better than 24, as uh, Rob said. The question is, do you need the 30? And we'll have that debate in, in, in a second. I think uh, John mentioned that LTE is uh, 16 times more efficient than LMR. 
you can do the numbers any way you want. Some people come up with eight or nine. Oh, excuse me. Some people come up with eight or nine. There are people I've seen who've come up with 30. Uh, grant me for a moment that it's a heck of a lot more efficient uh, than LMR. So at the end of the day, 10 might be 80, it might be 160, or it might be 300 as compared to LMR. So in my judgment, the emergencies are not going to be dealt with the 20 megahertz if we added the D block. They're going to require more than that. And that's where preemption and roaming comes in. That's not hard. It's built into the LTE standard, and it can be done. And there is no need for public safety to negotiate an individual contract with every, uh, every public safety organization in the, in negotiate a contract with the various carriers. That could be done on a centralized basis. It could be done as a master contract. It could be done by rule. I mean, there's a lot of ways it can be done to reduce the bureaucracy that's associated with that. The other thing I love about the, uh, the FCC plan, it really, for the first time, gives public safety the ability to ride on the benefits of the volume associated with commercial uh, production of components. The world is going LTE. Uh, LTE is going to be the standard worldwide. That means there are going to be millions and millions and millions of, uh, of LTE type devices, if not billions. The truth of the matter, to extend that, that 10 megahertz, becomes a trivial issue, and all of a sudden public safety has the benefits of economy at the scale. And uh, that, it, that goes not only to the handset, but it also goes to, uh, to the base stations. Okay, enough about spectrum. Let me talk very, very quickly about affordability. It's very simple where I come from. I had a lot to do to build the Verizon cellular network when I was the CTO at Verizon. If you want to build a network on a standalone network, uh, with all due respect to the folks who did the economics associated with that, at best it's understated. You're talking numbers like 18, 20, 25 billion dollars if, if, if you want to do a standalone network. The beauty of the FCC plan, it uses, reuses one of the most important in terms of economics and pricing parts of the infrastructures, the towers. Uh, that's expensive as hell, depending where you are. You could be paying thirty or forty thousand dollars a month to just have a small piece of real estate on a tower. Uh, the FCC plan, you don't have to build the tower, you don't have to go through the zoning changes, all of a sudden the expenses come way, way, way down. Also the time to market, to build a network, comes way down because you're using a structure that already exists. We talked about forty-four thousand uh, plus towers. Uh, of those 44,000, uh, 41,000 roughly already exist uh, and are ready to be used uh, with the exception of providing hardening, uh, which is uh, mainly dedicated to what happens when the power goes out kind of things and some, some other stuff. 2,500 of those have to be upgraded and only 800 new have to be built. The sum and total of all of that is you get 99% coverage, which Jamie said is, is, is a, and the $6.3 billion or $6.5 billion cap X is not, a, is not unreasonable. Now you can argue the difference between 5.5 and 7 billion, but it ain't gonna be 16 or 20 billion or, or that kind of number. Okay, lastly, because I wanna leave time for questions, public safety requirements. I'm going to go through a list really fast, but I don't think the argument is whether LTE can meet the requirements. The question is, is there enough of it to meet all the requirements simultaneously? Some of the requirements are obviously you want interoperability, the mid-air interface, LTE gives you that. You want a reliable network, you want closed user group, you want priority assignment within the public safety group, you want broadband data, you want TV. Uh, video rather, you want geolocation, you want telemetry, you want a large network, uh, nationwide coverage. Okay, there is a debate around 
how much spectrum or bit rate is required for video. Uh, and the range goes from 256 kilobits to 1.2 megahertz, uh, megabits rather. The problem with that is you can quadruple the amount of cell sites if you go to the high number because you have to keep the signal to noise ra uh, ratio good for the video, which means you need a hell of a lot more cell sites. So you have a very, very hard cost causer if you up the video requirement. Now, uh, Nipstick said 256 kilobits is good enough. Uh, Safecom said generally 256 is good enough. On occasion, 512 may be necessary. There are some vendors who are saying 1.2 uh, me uh, megabits are required. That blows the price of the network through, through the roof. So, to conclude, and since I've been known to be controversial, I can't resist it. I look at the plan. We could argue about the details of the plan. The thing that just I just don't understand is why do we need the PSST to add overhead to this plan? Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me anymore. Uh, in my judgment, they had their shot. They put so much weight on uh, what needed to be done that uh, nobody came to the party. I would argue there are a lot of alternatives to the PSST, including giving the license to the states. And God knows, I'm sure if the FCC put its head together, they can come up with a dozen alternatives that would minimize the bureaucracy. I was delighted to see the waivers that were granted, because what the FCC said is that the PSST could only charge uh, for the administrative costs and pretty much uh, minimize that kind of thing. To me, the important issue is not so much the license holder here, as long as it's the responsible party. It's getting the God Star network built. So with that, let me conclude. All right. Thanks, Ed. I'd like to invite our uh, panel to come, come on up, and we have time for uh, to revisit uh, a few of these aspects, answer some questions. Go ahead and take a seat. Sorry, it's a little little crowded with six up here. I have Kathleen between. Well, how about if? Um, actually, I suspect there may be some some chomping of the, of the bit to by one or two of you to respond to one or two of you. <laughs> um, as long as you keep it, as long as, long as we keep, well, let's keep these bite-sized, but uh, yeah. What, and one, simple, right? right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I know none, none of this is completely simple, but uh, I don't know, you know, Steve or Rob, if you want to uh, so, respond to anything you heard after you. So, so I'll just take, and, since, uh, since Ed responded to my interference thing, I'll just take okay, the first okay. one on, on the interference thing. And, uh, you know, I think Ed, we'll, we'll get you the analysis that was done. I mean, the holes around the interference and you know yes there you know the configuration is different on 800 megahertz because the LMR configuration with high site versus low site but even when you look at um, the inter interference between um, these systems it, it, it configured in with similar densities there are still holes created and I think some of the some of the issue comes around what's an acceptable level of service for commercial carriers and you know, what they're willing to accept for, um, uh, you know, reliability in, in some areas versus what is reliable for public safety. And again, you kind of look at, you know, across the system, if you look at it across the system, it's the percentage is pretty low. But when you look at it in those, right around those towers, it gets to be a significant issue. And the models are conservative. What we found in, the 800, in dealing with the 800 megahertz interference was that um, a lot of the cellular deployments are actually much, create a bigger interference problem than the models suggest because, uh, especially in these urban areas, the, the, uh, the antennas are deployed at very low um, altitudes near, you know, near buildings, freeways, and so you don't have a lot of propagation loss uh, between them. So, you know, we're, we're happy to share that, that information with you on, on the kind of interference created. And I think, one, you know, one of the problems here that exasperates that is that we're talking about 
two five megahertz blocks of spectrum. So if you're deploying LTE in a five, me you know, with a five megahertz bandwidth, it butts them immediately adjacent to one another. Other places in the 700 megahertz band, lower 700 megahertz, they're all uh, two by six megahertz blocks rather than two by five. So each carrier's got a little bit more flexibility to, uh, you know, move their traffic and, and resolve interference. Um, uh, Verizon in a C block uh, obviously has more spectrum with two by 11, so 22 megahertz altogether. So there's there's a little bit more um, flexibility there, and uh, and obviously between the C block and D block, you've got uh, a one megahertz that's licensed, but uh, you know also creates a uh, is not really suitable for LTE, so it creates a, a buffer there. So I think those interference problems are are real. Maybe the way to leave it so we can get on to something mm -hmm. else is just uh, to uh, disagree as, as friends for the time being. We're not going to solve it at this. <laughs> true. Let me take some testing. Who knows? So I had uh, uh, yeah, Robert, one or two points. Um, the, uh, at various points in our conversation, we've talked about solutions to the less amount of spectrum. And, the, and, and we keep saying throughout this whole thing so far, at least from you know, it's three versus two up here. I just want to point that out. Um, <laughs> um, but from one side of it is just build more sites. Okay. Oh, no, no, just build more sites. Okay. Oh, no, you got, you got interference. Just build more sites. Oh, you don't have enough. Capacity. Just build more sites. Every time you say you're going to build more sites, you're adding ongoing capital costs, right? But you're also adding time over time, year after year, operational costs for maintaining those sites. When does it end? As, you know, when, you know, and, and no, we can't go on the premise. Now, I'm certainly supportive of a balanced approach to this to say, okay, we build, need to build the right amount of um, sites consistent with the, be the best number of spectrum that we can get to. So I just want to be very careful with that there's not a serious implication or a serious result as if we continue to just add more sites in order to solve the, the capacity challenge or the interference. And the other thing was the 16, make, the $16 billion number I was, when I was making that reference to public safety's plan versus the FCC's plan. By the way, which public safety, as I did, sit, said on a, the board, public safety agrees in many ways with the FCC's plan. So we don't need to debate whether or not the FCC's plan is good. Please tell Jamie, don't reuse that too often. I get in a lot of trouble with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but for, but for the public safety, thank you, please. Um, but for the public safety, uh, but, but for the D block, okay? <laughs> but for the D block guys, okay? So, so, so no, we don't need to debate that. Um, and the last thing I would say is, I, I don't care what carrier is in this room, if I'm public safety and I know my people are super users and you, I'm, you know, I, and you're my roaming partner, I'm going to be a much better roaming partner with 20 megahertz of spectrum than I am going to be for 10 megahertz. There's no one in here, no one on TV, no one anywhere that can even question that. So if we're talking about what's in the best interest of public safety, we're talking about what's the best interest of the future, it's 20 megahertz of spectrum, period. Let me ask, um, you know, Rob and anyone else, yeah. I mean, on this 20 megahertz, there's the there's another 14 megahertz. Right, I was going to make that. In the, um, so <laughs> I should probably, so I should, I, I <laughs> I should probably let you make it, but I'm wondering how well, soon is that going to be available for an integrated network? I was involved in the original allocation network, of the right? 16 megahertz in the upper band there, so it was, it was 20, it's 24 for public safety, 36 for commercial up there. And so now we're talking about reversing that. I, I really have a hard time believing that public safety is going to need more spectrum than, than commercial users, I, mm. with all due respect. I, I think public safety has very bursty uses. They have particular localized uses. Uh, the, the good news is that the commercial carriers also can roam, and they can also move to other frequencies, for example. So these sorts of things, I think, are the dialogue that we can enter into and, and, and work through this. I, I think it's a new model in this band, and there's a, there's a real opportunity in doing that and setting the requirements, the standards, and so forth for that to meet some of that. And uh, so, yeah. Let me, let me add and to that, let me just say that the 14, I know you're going to come back and tell me it's don't narrow band voice, say. and I, 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 I was I on the, the, I was on the, I was no, on the original <laughs> advisory committee at the FCC where that 14 megahertz, I mean, there was a fight about whether that 14 megahertz, and my friends from Motorola were there, uh, and so uh, over time, I think that 14 megahertz, the whole band is going LTE, it just makes sense. 
that 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 voice is going to be a packet, whether you like it or not, in the future. And public safety really just needs to to get with that program early on. Plus, public safety has other spectrum holdings. When I was at the commission, we did report 99 megahertz then, and I think they've only added to the portfolio since that, with the 800 megahertz band, is dedicated to public safety in the U.S. So there are lots of other opportunities, whether it's in the 800 megahertz band, the 400 megahertz band, the 4.9 gigahertz band, for public safety to look to, to, to meet its needs. And so I think this is, this is something wow. to... Uh, that was a lot. And yeah, you know, I know. You, I, just, I love, my I wife does it to me all the time because she'll <laughs> ask me a question and then she'll answer it for me. Um, so um, so I've, I've got my own answer to the, to right. the narrow band thing there is, guys, we are in this place right here. We know, sorry, that Land Mobile Radio, right, there, there, is a, there is a shelf life for it. Are we at that point? No, that's over here. And we're over here, and we're trying to scale our networks for the future. So guess what, guys? It's not public safety's fault that they haven't deployed in that 700 megahertz narrow band, right? It took us that long for us to get it cleared. So that's the reason why. We're, now, there's some folks in the country that really need it. Now, there's some folks in the country that say, well, maybe they don't need it. But right now, the debate isn't. We, we, the one thing you don't do is shut off the, the one critical communication component that public safety has in the direction that we drove public safety to in the past in the past few years. Yeah. So we need that 700 megahertz narrow band while we work through our broadband deployments. Now, you mentioned a whole lot of other spectrum that public safety has, and I think you know, certainly in my slides, maybe we missed it, but I said in here to the effect that, yes, over time, we anticipate the public safety spectrum and other bands could be cleared and made available for commercial use as public safety transitions and migrates to the 700 megahertz band. Now, you can pick any frequency in the public safety holding. None will be better for public safety's future than the deep block. None. Not one. Certainly not 499, not 800, not any of the other four. None of that stuff is better than that one piece of contiguous spectrum. So we don't even need to debate that because we know what's best for public safety. And make, sure, make sure we're debating one. So I do. we do need to consider all of the spectrum that, that, that public safety has. But, but it, is, it is a false debate as to whether, uh, or at least at the moment, we are not debating whether commercial uh, users will need more spectrum per, per user than public safety is. Uh, it's an interesting speculation, but in fact, if you look at the numbers, we're asking how much more public safety needs. Right. Because even with 10 megahertz on a per user basis, that is more by far than the commercial users would get. If you include any of the additional spectrum you're counting, it's even more spectrum per user. So that is what the debate is. So, well, just, just, just if I may for one second, uh, I don't think there's any argument and uh, Rob mentioned it before. You know, for public safety, 10 is not as good as 20, is not good as 30. And on the margin, that's correct. But there's a couple of points associated with that. First and foremost, is it the best use of the 10? And if you accept the predicate that most of the time a lot of public safety spectrum is lying vacant, then that is obviously a question that needs to be addressed. And we could debate either side, side, side of that issue. Secondly, even if they got the additional um, 10 from the D block, it's not going to change the number of cell sites you require. Because these things are power limited, I, especially if you're dealing with video. The net result is you're still going to have to build a network that has those 44,000 plus uh, cell sites that have the coverage you, you, you need. And I, and I think we, you know, we would certainly agree you're going to need this a large number of cell sites, and that, um, you know, and that public safety traffic is um, is bursty, is not, you know, that right. they don't use all their capacity any time, but when they need it, they need it. Mm -hmm. So what we're being asked is for public safety to accept a promise, not an assurance that there's going to be capacity on the carrier networks, but the hope that there will be. To rely to rely on voluntary ro to rely on voluntary roaming agreements that that spectrum will be available when they you know when they need it. Um, the current priority preemption scheme for systems will only allow every fourth user to be a public safety user. So you know even under today's scenario, there's no there's no way that the uh, public safety can. Can actually use all the capacity on a on a carrier network. So, uh, 
you know, I think we're being asked to, to hope that this is the right way. I, I agree with Kathleen. We are looking at a different model here, a different world. It is a big shift. There's no question that public safety is going to be working with carriers, that they'll be deploying jointly. Maybe what we should do here is turn this from public safety being asked to accept the hope that these um, roaming agreements will be sufficient and instead allocate the spectrum to public safety and then allow them to um, lease ex any excess capacity back to commercial users. But that public safety has got control of that spectrum, that they've got the license, that they ultimately have the say in what's right for them. And then any excess capacity can be used by the commercial carriers. And so it's very much the same kind of approach, but turn some of the control issues um, back to public safety and provides them a higher level of assurance that uh, that they'll have that when Steve, they need you, uh, it. you know, you had said earlier that you were concerned that, you know, if, if you just auction the D-block, that public safety would be overly dependent, you know, on that, on the D-block licensee, for, you know, whether for build-out or for, for roaming. So how much difference will, would it make, you know, it's just, I guess for any of you, how much difference would it make if the commission uh, you know, re requires that it requires device interoperability across the 700 megahertz band to ensure, you know, in other words, requires all of the carriers on 700 to support, um, you know, support roaming and, 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 and build interoperable and support interoperable devices so that there's not this dependence on the D block licensee, but, you know, care, you know, but public safety can decide where who it wants to go with and where and maybe to everybody when it needs to. Let me just clarify, let me make sure I'm clear on the question, that you would require every every um, every carrier within the 700 megahertz band to include just the public safety spectrum and the D-block as a part of any device they build at 700, or are you saying everybody's going to have uh, everyone else's uh, uh, frequency? Which one are you asking? Right. Well, so let me make the assumption that you're asking that it's just the public safety spectrum that'll be included in the all the all the devices that are built. I'm just going to make that, that would be the easier case. I okay, suppose. so Go ahead. It, it, you know, hooray! You know, no, you know, you won't you won't get public safety having a problem saying I think that that the public safety spectrum be located in all the 700 megahertz devices. Um, you know, I think you know at least in the, the two carriers that you're working with both of them are you know have have strategies that they've already deployed has said publicly that they're going to include and some of if not all but some of those devices will include the public safety ban in their devices to the extent that they technically can so I think that the good news is is the natural aspects of the markets are already starting to take place where they're looking where, where I think the carriers are recognizing the opportunities um, to to work with public safety to build out these networks because you guys have been actually working very diligently with the way you've laid out your cost model and the rest of this to incentivize the carriers to actually participate in this process and thus build their networks consistent with what public safety would want and sharing their infrastructure, tower locations and all those things and devices. So I think we're already moving in that direction, this question of whether or not we actually have to have the D-block auction to force that I think is, is not a real issue. Yeah, and, and I think there's you know, we are seeing, I mean, there will be a lot of that occur, that occurs naturally for business reasons and for, for reasons that make sense. Um, you know, what, there are technical issues around including all the spectrum in, um, in every device. And, you know, we're looking at that now. Obviously, the commission has got a, a proceeding on that. Um, you know, right now the 700 megahertz band is divided into four band classes for LTE. And they can reduce that to two. But, well, that was a proposal is, is well, that for debate, pass right. to reduce it to two to simplify it. But. Right. So that's, I mean, so those, we guess, we're looking at the right. technical details of that. I mean, there was a reason that four band classes were done, but, you know, it's whether or not we can get to a point where we are able to effectively reduce it. And um, there are a limited number of different band classes that you can effectively support in any particular device. So you know, as the technology gets better, as we try and overcome these, I, I think that challenge gets less. It's whether or not we're at the point here or whether or not there needs to be a commission mandate to do something like that or whether it's something that's occurring naturally because of these market forces that are driving. Yeah, I would just argue that it is a unique case, the 700 meg, because of the mix of users in the band. I think it is usually the commission doesn't step in and do that, but I think there's a, there's a good reason to do so here given, I think, the mix of users. And frankly, to avoid maybe what happened in 800 or in, you know, in other bands where there wasn't such good planning going on. So I think 
you know, I think there's an opportunity here for the commission to do that. And uh, we're very uh, supportive as part of the 4G coalition to, to open up the band to not just number one, but number two of what you were describing there. So you have both the public safety and the commercial carriers being able to, to benefit across the band. Uh, from a common technology, which is also unique. I mean, the commission uh, signaled very strongly by saying that LTE is going to be the, the technology for the waiver uh, applicants, that, that that is the technology of choice for that band. So uh, the commission has not historically done that. It has historically left that to the market. So, but that's, that's a very strong signal that that's where this band's going to go. And if you have uh, an ecosystem of common technology, you have you have a benefit. I, I just had a meeting recently with somebody in the public safety community who s put on the table, no kidding, a brick. He said it cost him five thousand dollars. He could throw it into the bottom of a lake and it would operate for like ten hours or something. He said he, for that five thousand dollars, he'd rather buy fifty of the devices that I have and doesn't care if people lose it or whatever. So it's just a different model, I think, if if they can benefit from from the commercial carriers, uh, uh, vendors, then I think that they can get better technology and then get a lot cheaper. And uh, frankly, in that way, it's more expendable. Uh, I, I, can I question the, the, the premise of the question a bit? Um, do it. I'm not going to comment on, on whether, so yes, whether quick on, comments on the roaming gonna... issue, it will be a proceeding. Uh, but um, while there are lots of advantages to working with all of these providers, and, and, I, and I agree with that, the idea that you are ex specifically dependent on the D-Block licensee. There, uh, there is dependence, I mean, in the sense that it creates an ecosystem where devices will come out because in that band class, there's now lots of consumers. But that doesn't actually mean, and, and, and there's also lots of cost savings to work with the D-Block licensee. We see great advantages to that because um, they'll be building out at the same time. But that doesn't mean that they can only have either building partnerships or roaming arrangements with the D-Block licensee. I actually hope they will be, they will be working with all sorts of providers. It's not dependent. Well, and so my, but my point on that was that because of technical reasons, the technical reality of where the spectrum is, that they will be driven into that kind of alignment. Not that it's a commission mandate that they do that, um, but, you know, and, and not from device issues either, just that from the technical um, uh, issues that, that we've laid out, that that's the practical reality of it. Okay, let's get a couple questions before we run out of time. There's one way in the back. Lights are in my eyes, so it's hard to see, but to Hi, let us know uh, who, who I, you are, too. My name's Bill Anderley. I'm with TASC. We're the company that designed and engineered the New York City broadband wireless system. It's the first one out there that covers the whole city and does all of this stuff with, uh, with pre-LTE technology. Um, it's been, been well reported on. The good news is we have actuals, and they've been reported. And uh, both Northrop Grumman, our uh, former parent company, and, and Task, as well as Motorola and some others submitted them. Um, unfortunately, in these debates, the actuals seem to be ignored. Uh, Ed, we can't debate over the data and agree to disagree. The data seems to be pretty clear by those of us that have crawled all the way in it and looked at it and lived with it and so on. And that is that the five by five isn't enough, that public safety by, by five by five standards in many cities every day is, a, is an emergency, is a 9-11 day. N not just New York City as an example. Uh, John, I wanted to mention uh, uh, we should all appreciate your intellectual honesty in pointing out that there's no magic commercially in just the D-block itself, you know, as you said. Uh, that, you know, roaming, the interchangeability and so on, at least in theory, is up and down the band with some potential economic limitations. Um, to that end, uh, Steve made a good point, which is we're looking through the wrong end of the lens here. We're putting the 4G coalition's interests into a locked-in mode by uh, auctioning the D-block rather than putting public safety's interests first and giving them this unique land immediately adjacent to what they have. There's nothing in giving this to the 4G coalition that unlocks <clears throat> any of these benefits in the ecosphere. Public safety could do the same deals. And so it's a unique moment, but it's a unique moment for public safety to get this spectrum and then deal with it from there. Public safety should come first. So 
can I? Okay. I've, I've, I've uh, actually, first, I, I agree with you, the actuals matter. I'm a guy who, who spends a whole lot of time looking at real data to try and make decisions rather than abstract concepts. And I think New York City deserves credit as one of very, very, very few organizations that had anything quantitative to say, to say is what is the right amount of spectrum? Uh, or the right amount of all sorts of things, all that we had to figure out costs and all sorts of things, numbers matter. Um, but I've been through those numbers. Um, and I think actually they made among the strongest cases I've seen uh, probably inadvertently that 10 megahertz was plenty. Um, it w there was an assumption uh, that if, you know, we say, I, I, I tried to stress in my talk that number of towers matters. Spectrum matters as well, but number of towers matters. And New York City submitted a filing that said basically if we cut the number of towers we have today in half, then we won't have enough capacity to support what we think is the worst case. And we actually think, you know, using our model, that you, there should be funding out there for you to greatly increase the number of sites built. And if, if you do that by the New York City numbers, there would, you know, of, of New York City's estimate, not my estimate of what would be needed, there will be plenty. Uh, you know, people forget something. LTE has a reuse ratio of almost one. And the truth of the matter is the expenses of uh, cell sites, and I ran the Verizon network for a while, is not directly proportional to the cell sites because the closer they get, the more you could deploy a single truck to deal with a group of cell sites. But at the end of the day, the way you get capacity or at least increase the capacity of 10 megahertz is you basically have more cell sites. You start out uh, when the traffic is low with a limited number of cell sites, you pick the number, and then as time goes on, you just reuse the frequency. And that's the beauty of cellular technology, and it's by far the beauty of a LTE. Uh, just a quick uh, response. Just a really quick response to this, guys. We can do an engineering analysis of these needs and make it any way we want. There's just that much variable in this. Let's not play games. I mean, enough. Okay, enough with this. Goodness, I mean, you could build a model that's based on somebody standing right next to the base station and get one reading. You can put them like we did in our study, whoo, -hoo, at the cell edge, worst case study. You know, we can continue to bait this till we're blue in the face. And we're not gonna be any more closer to the answer. And the people on the hill must be looking at, these, looking at us like, what are these propeller heads talking about? Mm -hmm. I mean, my God. Of course we can do a model that says that we don't need the capacity, and by the same token, I can do a model that says we need all the capacity in the world, get throw in all the carrier stuff as well. That's just how much variables that exist in this that we cannot simply, we, we, we can architect our way out of it. So the short answer is really, actually not even have anything to do with capacity, the, the short answer is the D block is right next to the public safety spectrum. It's in the pub public's interest, public safety's interest, to allocate it, to give them a continuous block of spectrum, making it the most efficient use that you can have. It'd be great if some carriers had come a couple of years ago and actually bid it on this spectrum, because then we would have had a different current conversation right now, but they didn't. They didn't buy it. So now public safety can use that one contiguous piece and build it out, not only for today. The thing that, that, that most disturbs me about these discussions is we're basing this on what? We keep making it like public safety is going to be this. We know if we just go back 10 years, go back three years, our appetite is here and it's growing. So why should we scale our networks for this when we should be scaling them for this? You know what my biggest fear is here? And I really mean this with all due respect. We're sitting here with a plan that has funding attached to it. Six it five, does not. Uh, Wait, Steve, what, uh, let me finish, please. It's six it's six five billion dollars. It's at least six five six point five billion dollars that wasn't there if Congress approves it. There's also expenses of one point three billion per year in there. Okay, and the FCC is going to Congress to try to get this money. We start with this intramural thing. It wouldn't mean a darn thing if you got the uh, extra ten megahertz if the funding doesn't occur. There's no funding yet. Where's the funding? I said that the FCC is going to Congress to ask for it. Part of this plan doesn't leave the, the uh, launch pad unless the funding is there. 
what my Public concern safety is. Public doesn't want to take that risk. We've got nothing then. The, the track record of the FCC going to the Hill for funding for third parties is zero, so correct? Is me, your suggestion that $6.3 billion isn't required and public safety should Ed, pay you're for moving it? off the Hold point. On, there's no you, money you, there. We agree there's money the needed. Plan. There's no money in the plan. The FCC okay. has no assurance okay. of the money. Okay. Let Robert? Let me just All right. Everybody's Jeez. stipulated that, yeah, okay. there's no guarantees on um, getting funding from Congress. Let me just say that it's, it's, it's the diagram showed on the board. Nobody's debating the funding. But when you go to the Hill, why is the funding tied to the D block? Help me, help me with can that. I, no, no, no. It's I, not, right? It's not tied to the D block. Right. I'm glad you said uh, no, it. No, so, it is. And, and let me explain to you why Please. it is. If this thing turns into an intramural fly, fight, Congress is going to assume that there isn't a real plan. So, I mean, it's not directly tied. Don't misunderstand me. But if at the end of the day, public safety and the FTC are at odds, there's a very high probability that Congress will just put this on the shelf, agree with the gentleman in the back to the point, we have other fish to fry, and this thing just self-evaporates. So nobody has debated the fact that, the, you know, I'm sorry, some people in public safety have debated your numbers, but at the end of the day, what, six, seven, whatever billions, fine, we need funding to build it. I think we can all agree on that. And it's somewhere in the billions. 10 or less, whatever, cake for CapEx, and then 1.3 over the year. We'll figure it out, especially with these 21. Nobody is debating that. The question is, we know we need funding, and we know we need spectrum. I made very clear my points on that board when I went up there, when I was up there earlier. The two things you can take back 20 years ago to fix this problem yesterday was funding and spectrum, and we're saying we want both for public safety because that's what's in the best interest of public safety. It's not so, a false choice between the two. I, I was clear. Do you want to come up and right. join the panel? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I had to make that yeah, point. Yeah, we'll think of one at a time for New York. Uh, yeah. one, one thing I did, and I agree, you know, networks are very expensive to build. Sp spectrum is also very valuable. And, you know, I spent a lot of time at the FCC. You say the FCC has actually never generated money. Well, the spectrum auctions, I don't know what the number is now, but when I was there, it was, it was something like $25 billion had been generated by FCC auctions. So a lot of money is generated. For example, we bid in the AWS auction, we uh, generated $14 billion for the U.S. Treasury. Half of that money went to clear the federal government users. So there's actually about $6 billion sitting in a fund that OMB still administers. We'll take it. That could, yeah, I'm just saying, that's a model uh, that works, okay? and. Your, your federal counterparts at the FBI and, and the uh, DEA and so forth have taken, uh, taken advantage of that, okay? And that was, that was through legislation uh, that Congress created. So Congress has also used the proceeds to help fund the digital transition. Mm -hmm. So they've taken proceeds out of the 700 mm -hmm. megahertz auction to do right. that. So there's opportunities here, and I'm not just, you know, the, the D block alone is a $3 billion score, I guess, is what's on it. So, <laughs> You know, you have to find three billion dollars somewhere. Plus, you got to find the money, and we can debate what that price tag is. But for the build out of that network, and so the beauty of auctioning Spectrum is that it does generate money that public safety could embrace to fund uh, some of this, and it's it's worked. It worked very well in the AWS clearing context. There was a pot of money. There's still a pot of money. That, that's helping them to transition to better technology? Uh, you know, the short answer is absolutely. The commission has a long history of generating money for, for, um, for, for, for the country through auctions. I'm not debating that once. I'm really, I am not really debating that whatsoever. Okay, that's not the question, right? That isn't the question. The question is, is where are we going to get the money to build this network consistent with the FCC's plan? The D block does not make up and even come close to that. So I would argue that wherever we're getting the money from, let's just get three more, if you say three, let's get 1.5 more billion, or we can look at offsetting once public safety moves off of its spectrum and do a plan consistent with that. Yeah. Problem solved, done. I mean, well, what, the, the, the government why, why, is, is that, what is that, why is that a bad idea? Well, I would just say that to expand your horizons beyond just the D block, I mean, the commission is calling for 500 megahertz of spectrum in 10 years, 300 megahertz in five years. That's a lot of spectrum and a lot of value. So all I'm saying is that there, there's opportunities to extract value from these, these 
the spectrum thing that can can really help public safety. Uh, which, which is which is actually one of the things here. Yeah. Final, there's a lot of final quick comments because we're over time. Yeah. So <laughs> and DJ, one, one last quick thing. Yeah. So Steve. So uh, I'm just you know I mean there is a lot of spectrum and no question that the auction revenue can would be a good funding source for the network. It's just D block is such a small part of the potential funding source here. Uh, you know when you're small talking but about valuable. Small, <laughs> absolutely. I mean that's why that's why we're having the debate. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know there's a lot of other spectrum that uh, you know if as the FCC makes more available can be teed up to, for auctions to help fund that. Okay. John, were you burning for a final uh, here? Or? Actually, as, as a final comment, let me let me let me emphasize things both both Ed and Rob said that that um, there there may be disagreement on the D block, and I would cons I, I believe there are considerably more important issues that there is agreement on, and we should be working much harder to to to, to talk about uh, priority roaming, to talk about funding and efficient yeah. funding mechanisms, to talk about interoperability to talk about use of commercial technology and that is a message we should all be be giving right I mean I, I uh, just again I go back to our AWS experience I mean the some of the technology that I saw you know law enforcement officers walking around with uh, was sad and so the fact that through the auction process we were able to create a pot of money that the federal government could then dip into to get better technology so they could go for example from analog to digital so they could encrypt uh, things that is significant and I think that absolutely I would just echo what you were just saying John that there's so many areas of agreement here that we can really work on I think funding is a big one T-Mobile is very supportive of getting funding for public safety there's some very creative ways to to go about doing that and um, you know we'd like to work with uh, public safety on that and other issues so. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the panel for really cr helping to crystallize the debate. It's a lot more, I think it's a lot more clear, even though it's not resolved. So. <laughs>